For those of you who don't know me, no, my name is Mike Vranchik. I'm the Director of Government Relations. And this morning, we're going to have a discussion, I think a, a fruitful one, about some financial issues that impact <laughs> local boards directly. But uh, first, we're going to have a presentation. A lot of you have heard about the, the federal fiscal cliff. It's all over the news. But, but a lot of states have fiscal cliffs, and, and in particular, New Jersey. Um, there's, a, there's a, a report that's being put out by uh, uh, Volker Ravitch. Uh, it's Richard Volker and, and Paul Volker, a, a, a former Federal Reserve Chair, and Richard Ravitch, a former Lieutenant Governor of New York, have collaborated with a group that's looked at six states, New Jersey being one, and the circumstances in those states that, that make the, the, the financial structure of the state perilous moving forward. And I think in the context of a discussion about over-reliance on local property taxes, the, the, the first thing that everybody always thinks about is the, the, the resources that the state could provide to reduce the reliance at the local level on local property taxes. And I think the presentation you're about to hear from Rich Keevy is, is going to go a long way to, to, to giving you a picture of where the state exists now. Following Rich's comments, we're going to hear briefly from Ernie Riach and then Greg Edwards, and then we're going to open it up to a question and answer. And I think I'm really looking forward to that because this is a great opportunity for you to talk to people who know a lot more than I do about these issues and, and to, to sort of hone in on what this means for local school districts. And with that, I'll turn it over to Rich. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to try to zip through this in about 15 minutes that we have time for discussion. So some of my comments may go by rapidly, but I'll have everything up here on the, on the board there for you to look at. The general thrust of the presentation, in addition to what Mike told you about uh, this Ravage um, task force, Volcker Ravage task force that looked at six states, we also have an a interstate, intrastate group known as Facing Our Future that's looked specifically at New Jersey's relationship between the state government and local governments and how the nexus is very close together. So one thing happens in one level of government impacts another. And the, the news isn't good, if you might imagine, but that's the thrust of the presentation here. And let me just zip through some of these major points that you can see as well as I can read them. Spending is greater than revenue base. It's mostly applicable to the state government, but it's applicable to all levels of government. The spending far outstrips, or the desire for spending, far outstrips the revenue base. There's extensive and growing debt levels. Growing unfunded retirement liabilities. We hear that all the time, and it's real, and it's impacting every budget. Significant capital and infrastructure needs. I would have said that even before the disaster that just hit a couple weeks ago. It's not unique, and none of these statements are unique to New Jersey. Attracting business is a constant competitive challenge. We can't get revenue and growth unless we maintain and attract new businesses. The governor has a big emphasis on that during his administration to try to attract, in any way possible, new businesses to the state and to try to keep them, because that's also a problem. We have a stressed national economy, and the national economy, economy, economy affects us, obviously. Executive and legislative bodies have lost control over large parts of the budget. I might argue that 90% of the state budget's on autopilot because of pension requirements, health benefits requirements, school aid requirements, debt service, you name it, there's not much wiggle room in a typical budget each year. There's excessive reliance on the property tax level at the local government. If I was in a class and I asked the students, where do most of the revenues come from in the state? Half of them would always say, well, the income tax. That's the biggest revenue source. Well, if you put the income tax, sales, and corporation tax together, they don't equal the property tax. It's the dominant tax in New Jersey. Legacy cities, by that I mean the Newark, Camdens, Trentons, Pattersons, are problems for the state government in terms of the fiscal relationship. Public trust is lacking. All of us, just the last election, the issue was who's in charge? Do we trust what they're doing? Are they addressing the problems? Because of time, we'll spin by this, but basically this chart is saying we're in a death spiral. Lots of things are coming together that result in problems, and how do we get out of this vicious cycle that we're in? Some macro trends that are affecting the finances of state and local governments. The federal government is not helpful. It's getting worse, and it's going to get worse, worser. Because when the reductions start, making, uh, start occurring, 
they're going to be hitting the discretionary side of the budget just as much as the mandatory side. And the discretionary side of the budget is the money that comes, includes the money that comes back to local governments. The report I was associated with with the Volcker Ravitz suggests that 10% might be a big, what might be a norm that's going to happen when the federal budget starts being reduced. That would impact New Jersey to at least about a billion five hundred million dollars. The intergovernmental partnership has raveled. It's not a lot of connectivity anymore between what the federal government does to the state and local governments that is more negative than positive. Certain demographic trends are impacting state and local governments. The principal one being, I can see it, you all look like me, old. The population's getting older and it costs money to take care of us, or at least we assert that it costs a lot of money to take care of us. It's the dominant problem at the federal level and it has a, also an impact at the state and local levels. Tax systems are creating problems. It's very volatile. For example, when we had the problem in 2008 with the financial crisis, we were at a level of about $12 billion of state income tax. We dropped down to $10 billion in one year. Challenges the governor and the legislature and everybody else as to how to adopt to that kind of revenue structure that has significant volatility to it. The usual big spending items are continuing to grow. School aid, Medicaid, pension, social security, health care costs. They are on a track like that that presents problems every year and they're only going to get worse. This is the task force that I was associated with having to do with the Volcker Ravage. The main report came out in July. There's individual states are coming out now. They've, we've released California, Illinois, New Jersey's will be released in mid-November. I'll let Mike know about the date in case you guys and gals are interested in coming to it. Praise, December, I'm sorry. The presentation will be, I think, around the 15th at the Marriott in Trenton. But here was their conclusion of what are the threats. Now, we're talking about state governments here, but obviously the threats to the state government creates threats to school districts and municipalities. Medicaid spending continues to grow out to uh, crowd out other needs. The federal deficit reduction threatens the states. We, almost, we already commented about that. Unfunded retirement systems create risks. We had a big risk here in New Jersey. The governor and the legislature addressed a lot of it, but it continues to be a growing problem, and it will be in for the next seven years at least and further on. Unfunded, re uh, uh, let's see, narrow and eroding tax base and the volatile tax. I gave you that example of the income tax dropping down to suggest to you that the tax system in New Jersey is volatile and it's heavily dependent on the property tax. You put them together, you have constant pressures. Local government finances pose challenges. When you've got a problem at the local government, it impacts the state government is the thrust of this. Contrasted to the other five states that we looked at, New Jersey has exceptional oversight and control of municipalities and school districts. Lots of states don't, don't have what we have. Division local government, the uh, supervision of the local finance board. Over the years of a history, uh, the state has stepped in and helped out municipalities and school districts when they were in distress. Not so, if you notice in California, they got a lot of municipalities and school districts going bankrupt. State laws and practices hinder stability. Some states, New Jersey doesn't do this, you do cash basis worth of budgeting. They roll over bills. Illinois has seven months worth of bills they haven't paid. We don't do that in New Jersey, thank goodness. In New Jersey, K-12 funding is a significant part of the state budget. 40% of all spending is automatically going to, to school districts. It's a dominant cost in the state budget growing. Crowds out a lot of other expenditures, I would, might argue. You may not agree, but I might argue that. This is another chart having to do with what I just talked about was a thrust of the Volcker Ravage Task Force. This is a group here of what I call volunteer groups of former cabinet people in New Jersey state government. There's a former uh, Supreme Court justice, actually the chief justice, former state treasurers, both Republican and Democrat, former budget directors, me, former people who were lobbyists. It's a whole mix of people, not uh, Republican, not Democrat, even though some of them were, but people who are interested in the state. So they're looking at the crisis is facing New Jersey specifically. And one of the thrusts that they're making in the argument is you can't look at the problem of the school districts in general or municipalities or the state. They're all interactive. So much of the state budget goes back to municipalities and school districts. 
Most of the spending in the state is not by the state government. It's by municipalities, counties, and school districts, which we'll see in a minute here. Major revenue sources. This is sort of like a quiz. If we were in a class here, I would say to you, where does most of the revenue come from? 41% comes from the property tax. 16% from the income tax, 13% from the sales tax, et cetera. So the income, and as you know, probably, all of the income tax goes back to school districts and municipalities or property tax relief, but mostly school districts. So that money, uh, for fun together, if you take the property tax and the income tax, think of that as local government spending. In fact, here's another chart here that shows you where all the spending is. Regardless of whether it happens at the state level, the municipal level, or school district level, take a look at that chart. 40% of all spending in this state is for schools. 30% is for the state. I've excluded state aid because it's not spent by the state. It's spent by schools. 10% for counties, 20% for municipalities. In my judgment, a pretty powerful chart to show you where the spending occurs in the state of New Jersey, thinking of it in the aggregate. Then we have a series of charts here that show if you projected the state budget on a current services, by definition, current services might be something like this. What are you spending? Or it's a projection of what you're spending this year projected for the future, assuming you fund all the requirements. For example, the assumption is we're fully funding every school aid formula that exists. We're, we're, we're funding all caseload that occurs in Medicaid. We're funding all homestead rebates that used to be part of the base in the state. We're funding all needs for mental health and development, disabled, et cetera, et cetera. It is a projection, but it has some relevance. For example, here what it says is that if we spend on the current level, we have a gap developing, uh, depending upon what revenues you assume, of about $8 billion. Now, if I was the governor up here, I would say something like this, yeah, but we're going to solve that problem. And he would be absolutely right, because the state always balances his budget each year. But in balancing the budget, certain needs, as defined by my definition of current services, cannot be met. This would suggest to you that perhaps as you work your way out through this fiscal year, that all of the needs, including schools, can't possibly be addressed given the current needs of the state and the current revenue structure of the state. And in addition, note that one thing, not included in either shortfall is the unfunded liability of $25 billion for pension and $59 billion for health benefits. Now we're going to put money in the budget in there, but we have this existing gap that needs to be addressed. The governor, again, together with the legislature, has proposed and implemented a lot of changes that have put the retirement systems closer to being funded. Then we have a series of charts that say, well, those gaps don't just exist at the state level. They exist at all levels. I'm not going to spend a lot of time just going to zip through. You can look at the gaps here. You can see, for example, projections for municipalities show a gap, counties a gap, school districts a gap. The assumptions, if you want to pursue this thing, uh, the, the backup and analysis behind that, again, I will give the information to Mike, and you can have that. So having zipped through that, you have the Volcker Ravage Task Force that looked at six states and said, we're in problems. Some states worse than others. Obviously, if I was ranking them, Illinois would be in the league by themselves. California, not far behind them. But other states being looked at, like Virginia, probably in a lot better shape than most states. New York. New Jersey might put them in the same boat, troublesome, but have dealt with their problems. But the problems are going to be increasing and growing. So here's the major recommendations of the task force. And you might say, well, these, these don't solve the problems. That's true. But they position the states to do better. Accounting and transparent finances. Don't do any of this cash-based accounting. Make sure all your financial statements are done with proper accounting standards, and you will have a better understanding of what's going on. Lots of states, not New Jersey, don't do the right thing. Multi-year forecasts. The point being here, when you put a budget together in year one, you should be projecting what that impact would be for the next five or six years, similar to what I put out there in describing the projection of the current services. It doesn't mean you have to fund it. You can't ever fund all of these needs out there, but it gives you an idea of what the forecast might look, look like and how you have to address them, what has to be, in effect, reduced. 
Realistic countercyclical tools, rainy day funds. You need to husband some money and hold them back because the business cycle is such a phenomena that every year or every, every period of years you're going to have cycles that drive the budget revenue up and sometimes it's going to go down. You need some protective monies, if you will, a rainy day fund. Retirement systems need to be responsible. Reform tax structures might be worth a while for several of these states to take a look at their tax structure. Maybe it needs to be changed to make it more effective. Some people would argue we need a higher ta income tax rate. Other people would say that drives people out of the state. Maybe we ought to be fixing other aspects of the tax structure. Maybe we ought to be reducing the corporation tax rate to encourage people. It's a whole myriad of options that could be looked at. I would hasten to say it's not going to be a solution to long range problems, but it's worth taking a look at. Federal and state governments need to cooperate. I made that point several times. Control health costs. You know, the whole campaign recently for the presidential election hinged on some parts of health care costs. They are driving and they're going higher in the state budget. Medicaid is a dominant source. About, in addition to school aid being 40%, Medicaid's about another 16%. So you can see quickly why, where decisions get squeezed. Monitor local government finances, adopt a realistic capital budget to express and identify the, cap the infrastructure needs of the state. We do have a pretty good capital planning process in the state, but it really doesn't highlight the infrastructure needs. More needs to be done to improve it. Some additional observations, and I'll end here. We cannot, in my judgment, just grow or cut or tax our way out of this mess. It's just too big of a problem. There are no easy solutions. Every fiscal problem is interconnected. You can't say it's the state government's problem or the school district problems. They all roll together if you bought into what I presented earlier. States will be challenged to help municipalities and schools. We're already challenged. We're going to be more challenged. Need to maintain safety net programs. We need to be cognizant of the needs for those who are less fortunate than we are, as represented by the Medicaid programs, programs for the mentally ill, community development uh, community, uh, programs for the developmentally disabled. All of those issues need to be focused on to make sure we don't unnecessarily reduce those programs that are helping those folks. Future service delivery models will need to be changed. A subset of that way might be, why do we need 600 school districts? Why do we need 586 municipalities, et cetera, et cetera? Reorganizing and restructuring might be worth looking at. It's not going to solve the problem, but it'll address some of the needs. Competition for business needs to be reevaluated. Tax structures need to be reevaluated, but it will not be the answer. Political leaders and people need to understand and work together. You can't have this constant bickering. We need to have a cooperative solution, or at least a cooperative addressing of the problems and come up with some solution that everybody can buy into. A system of prioritization needs to be established. I'll end on that because some people say, we'll just raise money, that'll solve the problem. Wrong. That's going to not solve the problem. You're never going to be able to raise enough money to address what people want. So there needs to be better prioritization, a better system of re-identifying how we're structured, and that those together with a reevaluation of the tax system might place us in a better way to proceed along. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. This is, it's a lot to digest, I know, and I, I think the balance of the, the forum is going to be an, uh, an attempt to connect these, these large issues with the overarching issue that we all face as board members, the, the, the reliance on local property taxes versus the funding that the state can and should provide. Uh, I'm going to ask Ernie to make a few comments, and then Greg, and then we'll turn it over to you for questions. And we'll follow the same procedure as earlier. We'll have people come up to the microphones, and I'll recognize you in turn. Uh, one other comment I want to make for everybody is that uh, Rich has, uh, has said it already. We're videotaping this, and we're going to have it available for people who want to watch it on our website. But we're also going to have copies of the PowerPoint. So if anybody wants to have this to look at after the fact, just let me know. We'll make sure you get it. Thank you, Mike. Good morning. Everybody hates the property tax. I've said before, and I'll say again, I, I think sometimes that every baby born in New Jersey comes into the world screaming, property taxes are killing me. <laughs> but 
If I were sitting in your seats, I would be very cautious about any proposals for drastically reducing the property tax for schools, drastically reducing the school's reliance on the property tax. What are the alternatives? One of the problems is that the property tax is huge. As Richard mentioned, the property tax produces more money than the income tax and the sales tax combined. Uh, if the only, way, the only way you can reduce property taxes for schools in a significant way would be by shifting the burden over to some other tax, either to the income tax or the sales tax, probably. Um, one of the problems is that the income tax, again, Rich has mentioned this, one of the problems is that the income tax in New Jersey is a very volatile tax. When this tax was first implemented back in 1976, it was a pretty much a flat tax. The tax rates were either 2% or 2.5%. And as a flat tax, it was a, a relatively stable tax as far as income taxes go. But over the years, we have made amendment and amendment and amendment to the income tax law, which have raised the rates, the upper rates, and kept the lower rates about where they were before. So the tax, which was a very flat tax, originally has become a very progressive tax in New Jersey now, um, which means that most of the tax, most of the income tax is paid by high income taxpayers. And New Jersey high income taxpayers very often are tied into the New York financial markets. It's the, the way the income tax works in New Jersey really is affected to a considerable extent by the geography of the state. So that we rely on income taxpayers who, who have their source of, of uh, funding in the, the financial markets. And you know what happens to the financial markets. They go up and they go down, and they go up and they go down. Hopefully they go up a little more than they go down. Actually, income tax revenue rose about 12% in 2006. The next year, 12% in 2006, 7.5% in 2007, and the next year, 2008, it went down 17%. I don't think that's a very stable way to fund the public schools. So I would stay away from the property tax in, ter in terms of putting a, a large part of the funding of the school schools on that basis. The sales tax also is volatile, but not quite as much as the income tax. Sales tax revenue dropped 7.3% in 2008. You don't want to try to fund your schools with a tax that bounces up and down like this. The property tax has a lot of good qualities. I've been trying to emphasize that it's stable. Despite the recession, property taxes have continued to rise. People say that's a terrible thing. In terms of financing your local school budgets, that's a pretty damn good thing. It's a highly productive tax. I've mentioned that it exceeds both the sales tax and the income tax. It's a tax which is difficult to evade. It's a broad-based tax. Everybody pays in some way for the property tax, either directly or through their, their, the rent that they pay. It's the only tax that's controllable at the local level. And particularly for schools, the way we collect it in New Jersey is pretty favorable for school districts because the municipal government pays the cost of levying the tax, pays the cost of collecting the tax, and guarantees to you that you're going to get the revenue that you need from the tax, that you've said you need to run your schools. If the money doesn't come in, the municipality picks up the ball, not the school district. Actually, the burden of the property tax in New Jersey is much lower than it used to be. Back in 1971, the average state tax rate was $3.57, the equalized tax rate. $3.57 in 1971. In 2011, it was $2.07. We've done a lot in the last 30 or 40 years in terms of bringing down the burden of the property tax in New Jersey. Now, I don't want to give the impression that there are no problems with the property tax. There are. The biggest problem is that it depends for administration on 566 different local taxing jurisdictions. And some of them have a lot of taxable property, and some of them have very little taxable property. So in that sense, the property tax is not very equal across the state. Actually, and 
Sometimes when I, when I make this suggestion, people run screaming from the room, but a statewide property tax with some redistribution of that money would make a lot of sense in New Jersey because the property tax is a good tax, but its, its burden falls quite differently in different communities. If we could tax everybody at a standard rate and then redistribute that money to equalize resources, I think we would be a step ahead. Finally, why do we hate the property tax? The first thing I said was we all hate it, but why do we hate it? I think one of the major reasons we hate the property tax is the way we collect it. With the, in with the income tax, most taxpayers pay most of it as a payroll deduction. Who, how many taxpayers can quote their gross monthly paycheck? No, you know what you take home. Take home pay is all that people focus on. Uh, with the sales tax, we pay it generally in a few pennies here and there, unless you go out and buy a big ticket item, a car or a refrigerator or a motorboat. Uh, but with the property tax, how do we pay the property tax? Well, if our mortgage is paid off, we have to write four big checks a year. And boy, that really hits home when that month comes up and you have to pay, pay the property tax. If, you're, if your mortgage isn't paid off and you're you're paying the property tax as, as part of your monthly mortgage payment, the two get tangled up and people think, oh, that was terrible property taxes when they write that monthly check for the mortgage. Let me conclude again by saying pretty much what I said at the first. Be very cautious about replacing the property tax as a way of funding the schools. It's a damn good tax for that purpose. Thank you. Well, good morning to uh, everyone. I want to thank Mike Francic and uh, School Boards Association for inviting me to participate in your delegate assembly today. It's always a pleasure for me to share a platform with uh, Rich and uh, Ernie, who've uh, over the years taught me a lot about what I know about the um, New Jersey tax system. Um, let me say that I, I want to ad address you briefly the, this morning from the perspective of someone who's been involved in decades uh, in the education policy area. And that experience comes from working in, um, um, in state government uh, and, uh, and also uh, sort of from the outside for a few years agitating on some policy matters. And, but maybe most importantly to you as uh, someone who's been a local practitioner, I did spend uh, four years on the school board next door in um, Hamilton, uh, Hamilton Township. And if you, and if you know Hamilton, you, you know that it's, uh, I think, the seventh or eighth largest uh, school district in the state, you know, K to 12, with a very diverse population. So I understand uh, the uh, trials and tribulations that school board members um, um, have to deal with on a, uh, on a daily basis. And I'm sympathetic to, um, to the concerns that you bring to an issue like this, because I've had to deal with folks complaining to me about property taxes. I, I know exactly what the... Um, what the problem is, but let me um, hasten to add, though, that, um, that I, I just do want to make clear I, I, I am the Deputy Secretary of the New Jersey Higher Education Agency. I'm not here speaking on behalf of the Christie administration or anybody else. I'm giving you my, uh, my own point of view, having, um, uh, having been involved in this area for a, a long time. I am um, grateful to Ernie for, um, for putting the property tax in perspective. I know you probably think, well, how is it that these three folks come here, claim they know an awful lot about things, um, sing the praises of the property tax system when all we hear are complaints? And uh, I know it's a, um, it seems to be disconsonant from everything else you deal with, but, um, but I think that some of the things that Ernie talked about are very important to remember. I'm not going to... Um, to repeat them, but I do want to highlight a, a couple things and then and then suggest to you some um, some some things you could be advocating. I think from a state policy perspective that would help um, deal with the problem that um, uh, that you have on a on a uh, daily and weekly basis when you talk with your uh, when you talk with your own constituents. Um, 
the the fact that the the uh, the property tax is 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 a very stable source of revenue, particularly as compared to almost every other option you might have in front of you, I think is no small matter. Certainly from a budgeting perspective, it's very good for you, your superintendents, your business administrators, to be able to look from year to year and pretty much know how much you're going to have to spend and, and what sort of increases you can plan on. And we're talking about, as Ernie said, um, in most instances, regular increases. I mean, I would invite you to put yourselves in the um, position of state policymakers who have in some years actually had to deal with budgets in which revenue was less than what it was the year before. Very difficult um, situation, one in, which, uh, one in which local governments, frankly, do not have to, typically don't have to contend with unless you've had something maybe very significant happen in town if it's a small community and maybe you've lost a big tax rateable. I don't want to minimize those things, but by and large, that's not the experience that school districts and municipalities and counties have, but it certainly is the sort of experience that state government has, sometimes on an annual, um, on an annual basis. I also think that um, uh, it's, again, important to, to keep in mind um, the, what Ernie talks about, about taxes collected locally and distributed locally. Now, when you combine the issue of the volatility of state revenues and the fact that it's the state government giving money out, um, I, I firmly believe that if you were to advocate for a system in which more money came from the state, collected by the state, two things would happen. The amount of money you get from year to year, you would never know about. I think history proves that to be the case because you know whenever income tax revenues are down, what's one of the first things state government does? It cuts school aid. I mean, that, we all know that. And I don't think you want to put yourself in a situation that would make that an even more likely outcome um, uh, of, a, of, a, uh, of a bad or, let's say, anemic um, economy. So I think you certainly would have a situation in which you'd, you'd know less year to year about how much money you're going to get from the state. And the second thing I want to suggest is this. If more money is going to come from state government, you can guess one other thing is going to happen. There will be a lot more state control. There would absolutely be. Now, in this state, there is already a fair amount of state control in education policy. I, I recognize that. I think there would be even more. I cannot imagine a situation in which state government provides um, 60, you pick a figure, 67%, 70% maybe of, of, local, of local spending and not also um, have a very big impact on how that money is going to be spent. I would bet under those terms the role of, of local education might disappear um, altogether. Now, some people would say that's a good thing. I, I personally do not. I believe in... Um, I believe in local control. I think there's a lot to be said for it in the education policy area. I can nearly guarantee that I think a lot of it would go away um, uh, in a situation in which, in which uh, you were relying a lot more on, um, on state revenues. I'd also point out one other thing, and I don't know if it's in Rich's calculations, but this is a little bugaboo of mine. I know sometimes school districts don't like to hear about this, but you all pretty much know how much you get in state aid from year to year. But I know for a fact most school districts don't count one very big pot of money that uh, certainly benefits you, but you never see it, so you oftentimes don't appreciate it. And that is a fact. The state government pays every penny of your pension contribution for all of your certificated employees. And it also pays for the health um, benefits for all of the retired certificated employees who have more than 25 years of service. These are not small ticket items. And Social Security. And, excuse me, yes, and Social Security. I'm aware of only one other state on the pension and Social Security side that does the same thing, and that's the state of Alabama. I just say that because from a taxpayer's point of view, I want to know um, you know, how, how this pie is getting cut up. And I think, to be fair, when you think about the support you get from state government, you really need to count that money because those are employees that you've hired. They are oftentimes, their contribution rates are triggered off the salaries that you all negotiate. But the state comes along and makes those contributions, and you have no liability for them 
whatsoever. Now, I understand state government's not, uh, you know, done the best job in, in managing that liability, but it, in fact, that's not really your problem. It's, it's the state's. So I do think that when you look at the, um, the reliance that we have on property tax in New Jersey, and it is admittedly high. I mean, I think maybe second highest in the, in the, um, in the country um, behind uh, New Hampshire, if you factor in uh, the pension contributions, it's a, it's a, um, it's a different story. And I know, I know many leaders in local education were not happy when the DOE did its new um, per pupil calculation, but, and I was at the department at the time and was very insistent that we need to start looking at these cost figures as an all-in amount and not make these artificial um, judgments about um, you know, what it, real, what it costs at the local level and exclude a lot of, a lot of other costs that, um, that taxpayers ultimately all have, to, um, all have to pay for. So you're going to say to me, all right, well, you've just told me that property tax is the best thing since uh, uh, sliced bread. Maybe not wonder sliced bread, but somebody's sliced bread. Uh, and, uh, and so, Greg, I feel completely unsatisfied by this whole discussion. So let me, so let me offer you some suggestions, I think, that would make a difference um, um, to your uh, to your taxpayers, and I th something I think the association could um, could take up. Um, I don't want to uh, speak for Ernie. He he made one suggestion, which was a st which is a statewide um, property tax, and I and I'm not sure where I, f I fall on that issue. I do think though that um, that that a, an increased effort to provide targeted property tax relief to those who really need it um, would be helpful to all of you. So what I'm talking about is a, some sort of uh, circuit breaker system, which we have a little bit in the, in this, in the, um, in the senior program now, uh, where, you, where you, you might cap the property tax in terms of um, you know, how much of your income is going to pay for the property tax. Now that clearly would fall as a burden on state government because somebody has to make up that difference. I mean, you budget and you expect the property tax, so the state would have to come in and say, well, we're going to cap this family's property tax amount, but in turn we're going to provide that money to you um, anyway. It, it reduces their exposure and liability, but um, maintains things for you. Uh, you know, this generally speaking, I think, is an issue for um, seniors who see their taxes, particularly their property taxes, tend to go up more than what their, um, what their income is. This does, by the way, doesn't affect all seniors, frankly. Um, sometimes I feel that seniors today are in a better situation that, than, um, uh, than I am. But uh, for some, it, it, is a, it is a problem. And uh, so I think that's one, that's one thing you ought to, um, um, that you ought to look at. The debate that happened I th it was instructive, I think, between the governor and Senator Sweeney over the governor's income tax proposal. You know, Senator Sweeney came back and said, well, we ought to be giving a, um, a, a credit off the income tax for property taxes paid. Now, which I think is an interesting idea, and of course the governor said, well, I can work with that. Um, you may recall that some years ago, a version of this existed in New Jersey, and that was to give credit, and the credit applied um, rightly so, I think, um, not to all property tax, but to property tax paid in order to support local schools. The reason why I like that approach is because, and let's face it, for, for most folks, this is an issue for suburban school districts in which you have a sort of ugly, ugly dynamic that occurs. You have a lot of constituents, constituents who, are paying, who are paying income tax. That money gets collected and gets sent everywhere, but except to your school system. And they have to pay an awful lot in property taxes. So I think that if you had a system in which you gave a credit based on the school tax, you could begin to provide the relief to those who are paying the most to support education. And I think that, frankly, when you look at the big picture, I don't think that's an unfair way to go. Now, I, you know, I recognize that that would not provide as much relief to... Um, to urban um, residents, but then again, they are already benefiting from an awful lot of state aid that's already going into those um, uh, communities. So I offer that as a possibility. And thirdly, some states now are have have begun to um, to experiment with education savings accounts, which would operate similar to what an IRA does or a health savings account, which allows taxpayers to set up an account. 
uh, and spend money out of the account for educational purposes, and they would get preferential tax treatment for the contributions made into the account. Property tax or an income tax credit or deduction, you know, there's lots of different ways to, um, uh, to do that. The reason why I like that, too, is because um, that begins to address one of the concerns that you folks have, I know, um, uh, when you're dealing with, with, uh, with your local constituents, and that is there's always going to be a large number of folks who are sending their kids other to other than the proper, to the public school system. Now, frankly, for a lot of you, it's a good deal because they're still paying their property tax, um, and you're not having the cost of educating those kids, but they get resentful about this. And if you could give them a system in which they could set up their own accounts and maybe, and use it to pay tuitions and the like, and get some sort of tax relief uh, that recognizes those um, payments and costs that they're having to absorb, I think that might make them all feel a little bit better about the property taxes they're paying to school districts. Now again, that, that's a cost to state government, and I think you need to weigh those costs against all of the other, um, uh, uh, priorities you might have in a, as an association, but I think it would be another way to recognize the sacrifices that taxpayers have to make. And by the way, it's not just the parent who's sending a child to a, to a private school. You have parents who are spending money on um, tutoring for their, for their kids or computers, so all that sort of stuff, and this would be a way to, to, to recognize those, um, those expenditures and try to provide some uh, relief as they do it. And the last point I would make is this. Um, you're now operating sort of in a new paradigm here, and I would encourage you to just take a breath and let that paradigm work for a while. And what I'm talking about is this. M most school districts now have, have I think, wisely chosen to, um, uh, to move their uh, election of school board members to November and to take the budget off the ballot. I think that has the opportunity to create a whole new dynamic as to what happens locally about spending issues. Um, and I think before you think about some major change in this tax system, it would behoove all of us to let this new system go for a few years, take a step back and look and see how it's worked and say, all right, we're not feeling the pressure we used to have. More people are now participating in decisions through the election of school board members. We don't have this problem every year going to the, to the ballot with the budget and losing and having uh, you know, all the, the problems that we have there. We're no longer the subject of, of anger because our budget is the only one on the ballot. I think there are lots of good things to say about this system, but I also think it's something that we need to um, fairly look at. So I would just counsel that you take a, uh, you take a breath and, and see how that works out. So uh, Mike, again, thank you.